right, hi everyone. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. I just wanted to quickly introduce myself. My name is Priyanka Sarkel. I am a journalism and media studies major here at Rutgers and a cinema studies and creative writing double minor. I'm a second year leadership scholar at the Institute for Women's Leadership here at Rutgers. And thank you so much, all of you, for coming out to a reading and discussion of Kaveh Akbar's first novel, Martyr. So I'm halfway through this book and reading this book has affirmed my understanding of the power of storytelling in our world and society. When many are lost and struggling to find meaning, we often turn to history and to others' experiences. I also consider myself to be a storyteller. I consider myself to be a creative writer, an aspiring novelist, and also a journalist. I I would really love to be a voice for the voiceless, as cliche as that sounds, but I do think there is some value in that. I've seen the busy newsrooms of CNN and CBS during my time here at Rutgers, and as a result, I've also realized the power of rhetoric and language in our world and society and how those things can shape our perceptions and direct our empathy. How much the passive voice can determine whose grief gets to be acknowledged whose historical context is relevant, who gets killed versus who is murdered, who is a young man or a young woman and who gets to be children, who is eliminated versus who gets to be martyred. All of these thoughts bring me to the wonderful wordsmiths involved in making this event tonight possible. This event is presented by Dr. Roxanne Gay. She is the Gloria Steinem Endowed Chair in Media, Culture, and feminist studies here at Rutgers. This chair is a collaboration between the IWL, which is the Institute for Women's Leadership, the School of Communication and Information, and the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Department. This chair also addresses the intersection of media, culture, and social change. I had the great honor of taking two classes with Dr. Gay during my time here at Rutgers. Honestly, getting to experience her knowledge, her wisdom, her craft, and her grace as a professor truly, truly helped me become a more confident and more skillful, skillful writer. I will always remember when I turned in my first assignment for her class, she said, this is excellent and you should publish it. Hearing her affirm my potential to be a writer has greatly helped me to become more dedicated to my craft. And I will always remember her and thank her for being my mentor. And it was truly a privilege to be her student. Dr. Gay is a celebrated writer, professor, editor, and cultural critic. She is known for her books, Bad Feminist, Hunger, Difficult Woman, Aiti, and most recently, Opinions. She's a regular columnist at the New York Times and a curator for her newsletter, The Audacity. In conversation with Kaveh Akbar tonight is Professor Adam Dalva. He is a senior fiction editor at Guernica Magazine. He is also a creative writing professor at Rutgers and also my former professor. He's a books editor at Words Without Borders, a board member of the National Book Critics Circle. His writing has been seen in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The Paris Review, and The New York Review of Books. <laughs> He is also the author of the graphic novel series, Olivia Twist. I'm also so grateful to have had Professor Dalva as my professor last semester, where his workshops have also really helped me become a better writer. And finally, our guest tonight, Kaveh Akbar is a celebrated poet whose poems are in The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Paris Review, and Best American Poetry. He is the author of two poetry collections, Pilgrim Bell and Calling a Wolf a Wolf. He is the author of the chapbook Portrait of the Alcoholic and the poetry editor of The Nation. Martyr is Kaveh Akbar's first novel, a contemporary fiction which follows Cyrus Shams, a recovering addict and an orphan of Im Iranian immigrants who goes on a journey to make meaning of death through art, faith, history, and tragedy. Books from all of these authors will be sold and signed outside at the end of the event. Join me in welcoming our guest, Kaveh Akbar, to Rutgers tonight. You can all, even in the back, you can hear me. Yeah, okay. and this, this one is very hot. Okay. Hi. Hey, uh, so glad we're here. Um, 
we thought we might start with a little reading from this beautiful book. Uh, a little context is I heard Kava read from this book in July in Paris, and I was just telling him that was one of the best fiction readings I'd ever heard in my life. So, so I, I thought, thought it would be unfair, unfair not to give him the taste. That's very sweet. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I'll just read the very, very opening pages. Um, thank you all for being here, by the way. I, it's not lost on me that the opportunity cost of coming to a poetry reading on a Monday, or er, not poetry, what is this novel? Remember, Remember your genre. Uh, who was it called uh, genre minimum security prison? Uh, but um, yeah, this is, uh, it's not lost on me that the opportunity cost of your being here is like you spending an hour learning to tango on YouTube, or you learning you know, Esperanto on Duolingo for an hour, you know what I mean? Like, like you could be, the opportunity cost of doing literary stuff has never been greater, literally, in the history of humanity. And um, it's a profound gift to get to be here with you all, sincerely, I mean that. Um, I'm just gonna read the first couple pages of the novel. Uh, you're welcome to follow along, you don't have to, hopefully. Um, I know, I know, you guys are so assiduously, like, just <laughs> locked in, that's beautiful. Um, that rules. Okay, so I'm just going to read it to you, um, uh, just these first couple pages. You don't need to know anything. <laughs> just generally. <laughs> oh, and thank you, Priyanka, by the way. That was uh, really great. Thanks so much for that intro. Will you guys give Priyanka a round of applause? Priyanka's an undergrad, too. Uh, maybe you, too, someday will be introducing, uh, um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read to you now. Maybe it was that Cyrus had done the wrong drugs in the right order, or the right drugs in the wrong order. But when God finally spoke back to him after 27 years of silence, what Cyrus wanted more than anything else was a do-over. Clarification. Lying on his mattress that smelled like piss and Febreze, in his bedroom that smelled like piss and Febreze, Cyrus stared up at the room's single light bulb, willing it to blink again, willing God to confirm that the bulb's flicker had been a divine action and not just the old apartment's trashy wiring. Flash it on and off, Cyrus had been thinking, not for the first time in his life. Just a little wink and I'll sell all my shit and buy a camel. I'll start over. All his shit at that moment amounted to a pile of soiled laundry and a stack of books borrowed from various libraries and never returned. Poetry and biographies, to the lighthouse, my uncle Napoleon. Never mind all that, though. Cyrus meant it. Why should the prophet Muhammad get a whole visit from an archangel? Why should Saul get to see the literal light of heaven on the road to Damascus? Of course it would be easy to establish bedrock faith after such clear-cut revelation. How was it fair to celebrate those guys for faith that wasn't faith at all, that was just obedience to what they plainly observed to be true? And what sense did it make to punish the rest of humanity, who had never been privy to such explicit revelation, to make everyone else lurch from crisis to crisis, desperately alone. But then, it happened for Cyrus, too, right there in that ratty Indiana bedroom. He asked God to reveal himself, herself, themself, itself, whatever. He asked with all the earnestness at his disposal, which was troves. If every relationship was a series of advances and retreats, Cyrus was almost never the retreater sharing everything important about himself at a word, a smile, with a shrug as if to say, those are just facts, why should I be ashamed? He'd lain there on the bare mattress on the hardwood floor, letting his cigarette ash on his bare stomach like some sulky prince, thinking, turn the lights on and off, Lord, and I'll buy a donkey, I promise. I'll buy a camel and ride him to Medina, to Gethsemane, wherever. Just flash the lights and I'll figure it out, I promise. He was thinking this, and then it, something, happened. The light bulb flickered, or maybe it got brighter, 
like a camera's flash going off across the street, just a fraction of a fraction of a second like that. And then it was back to normal, just a regular yellow bulb. Cyrus tried to recount the drugs he'd done that day, the standard bouquet of booze, weed, cigarettes, clonopin, Adderall, Neurontin. He had a couple Percocets left, but he'd been saving them for later that evening. None of what he'd taken was exotic, nothing that would make him out now hallucinate. He felt pretty sober, in fact, relative to his baseline. He wondered if it had maybe been the sheer weight of his wanting or his watching that strained his eyes till they saw what they'd wanted to see. He wondered if maybe that was how God worked now in the new world. Tired of interventionist pyrotechnics like burning bushes and locust plagues, maybe God now worked through the tired eyes of drunk Iranians in the American Midwest, through CBS handles of bourbon and little pink pills with G31 written on their side. Cyrus took a pull from the giant plastic old pro bottle. The whiskey did, for him, what a bedside table did for normal people. It was always at the head of his mattress, holding what was essential to him in place. It lifted him daily from the same sleep it eventually set him into. Lying there, reflecting on the possible miracle he'd just experienced, Cyrus asked God to do it again. <laughs> Confirmation, like typing your password in twice to a web browser. Surely if the all-knowing creator of the universe had wanted to reveal themselves to Cyrus, there'd be no ambiguity. Cyrus stared at the ceiling light, which in the fog of his cigarette smoke looked like a watery moon, and waited for it to happen again but it didn't. Whatever sliver of a flicker he had or hadn't perceived didn't come back. And so, lying there in the stuffy haze of relative sobriety, itself a kind of high, amidst the underwear and cans and dried piss and empty orange pill bottles and half-read books held open against the hardwood, breaking their spines to face away, Cyrus had a decision to make. So that's a very beautiful opening to a very beautiful book. I'm so glad many of you have it with you, and I can't wait to hear all semester what you think. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, I was wondering, maybe since you read the beginning, if you could start a bit with the choice to start here. Was this always the beginning of this book? Uh, right after this, the book will flash two years forward into kind of your thrust of plot. Yeah. So is this a sort of epiphany or false epiphany, depending on how you're reading it? Was it always the starting point, or did you find this later in your process? Yeah, I like that question. Um, I wrote this book in a very sort of pointless way. I wrote it in these tiny little scenes and um, and sort of uh, moved orbitally around the plot more than I moved linearly through a plot. Um, you know, some writers start at the beginning of a story and move very dutifully chronologically through the story as it goes. Um, I am not one of those writers. Um, I'm much more distractible. Um, and so I wrote this scene just when I was getting to know Cyrus, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm someone who writes constantly. I, this book could have been 1,500 pages if I, you know, if I was feeling a little bit more um, uh, antagonistic towards the reader. Um, but, uh, but it, 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 as soon as I wrote this, I realized it was the beginning, and I liked the way that it sets things in motion in a sort of ambiguous way. You know. Like, you can read the book, it's not a spoiler to say that you never find out, like, it, there's never, like, God comes down from heaven and says, like, that was definitely me flashing the light bulb, or, or you know, and there's never a moment where, you know, Cyrus is like, oh, yeah, no, here's the electrician who says that the light was messed up, you know what I mean, like, you never really find out if that little flicker was or wasn't some divine actor, right, and so you have to sort of move through the whole book wondering, as Cyrus wonders whether 
you know, he's received some sort of prophetic vision or whether, you know, he was just so, right? Um, which I think is something that a lot of people can relate to. And the book um, does exist in a sort of plane of not knowing. So Cyrus goes into recovery, he's an AA, and two years later he gets a sort of inspiration from a friend to travel to Brooklyn and meet with an artist. And th that's kind of the, if, if you were filming it, that would be like the plot. But in all of that, he's really someone who doesn't know himself was my feeling. And, and the book seems to really be exploring him from all these different angles. So I wonder if you could talk a bit about not knowing and knowing and the kind of journey your protagonist goes on. Yeah, I love talking about not knowing. Did I get like deeper? Whoa. You're getting profound. Yeah, no, she got the fever in my voice. Thank you. Um, Can I have some of that too? No, I feel like I just like went from uh, like that to like very white. You know? uh, now they're gonna write it down. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, shit, what was oh, right, right, that's right. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that I think that one of the so I am a person in recovery. Um, it has the tenor of intimacy when I say that to you, but it's actually one of the most Googleable facts about me. Like you're like you seeing me in person reveals to you that I am a tall man, I am a minimum six four man. And that is not Googleable, whereas like the fact that I'm in recovery is so like there's this weird performance of intimacy that I can get away with uh, by saying that I'm anyways, I'm a person in recovery. And um, and one of the great crises for me in my person of my um, sort of psycho-spiritual maturation has been learning to sit in uncertainties without groping desperately and organically to resolve them. Um, and I find that this is also what the art in which I'm most interested in does, and what the kind of rhetoric in which I'm least interested in doesn't do, right? So like, you know, the most certain language that you will hear comes from zealots and pirates, right? You know, this, this immigrants are evil, climate change is a hoax, this watch will make you sexually irresistible, right? Like, these are, this is the language of certainty, right? And our, our grammar, the technology that, of our art um, is built around expressions of certainty. You know, there are four kinds of, there are four kinds of senses in the English language, declarative, imperative, interrogative, and explanatory. And two of those are articulations of certainty, right? And we, and the most common two, right? The two kinds of senses of the day the period are, are expressions of certainty, right? You go around declaring things to be the case, and you go around telling people to do things, right? Those are both very certain of themselves, right? Spreading around, you know, very, very confidently, right? And this is the technology that I use to tell my nieces that I love them. This is the technology that I use to try to talk about my fear of the possibility that there's a God or my fear of the possibility that there is no God, right? Um, this is also the technology of my art, right? And so how do you denude this technology of this sort of onboard certainty? How do you denude, how do you play certainty from the period? Right, this has been a, a longitudinal project of my art alongside its sort of set of spiritual relative in my own life, right? Like as I'm exploring it in my own living and trying to be less certain about how I feel about this and that in the world, um, I find myself exploring that same idea artistically. And, uh, you know, it, continuing in the interrogative mood over here, like, you know, you, you are, so for those who don't know, a very beautiful and gifted poet. If you're coming to Kava from Martyr, you know, your books of poetry, I think, were generationally important for a lot of poets, including some great poets who are in the room, who probably feel like you abandoned their genre. I'm kidding. There's no, there's no, there's no scarcity. <laughs> It's not like this book took away a book of poetry, like this was just the next thing. 
And so I wanted to actually ask about that next thing question. Um, we met when I went to take a poetry class of yours. That's how much I love your right, poetry. Right, right, you know, right, so you know right, I'm yeah. a fan. I forgot that. That, yeah. was for, that was so long. A long time ago. Yeah. yeah. Look at us. Yeah. Look at our pictures. I know. Looking, I don't know what y'all we were, were looking at like, giant pictures uh, of ourselves. Right. Like a picture of <laughs> I wish was here, but uh, can't be this evening. But there's this thing that we, not to like sort of, our, I, I kind of mean when people do this, but like there's this thing that uh, in our household, in Farsi, we have this expression, which is like, uh, like you would say it if like my brother had to work some night and, and so he wasn't at the dinner table. Um, guys, people <laughs> Uh, my former student Nick and my spouse's former student Grace slash kind of my former student. Well, 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 Thank you for coming. But yeah, we uh, we we say this expression Jaish uh, Mahali, which literally translates to your place is empty, right? Like my brother's place is empty, right? And uh, and not to like artificially leverage my like exoticism capital, but there's just no uh, English equivalent exactly. And I was thinking it about Roxanne, like when I sat down here, like she's sort of like the third chair in the room, and we all love her very much. And, um, on our special for Roxanne. Um, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, we can clap for Roxanne. Uh, for Roxanne sorry. You can call her Roxanne. Yeah, well, I, you know, um, I used to teach middle school, and so I was like so in the habit of calling, you know, my, my friends like Mr. Moffitt and Mr. You know, like, and, and calling by their act, like the names of the students of call them. What was the question? I didn't get to it. Oh, <laughs> sensational. Great. This is going great. Yes, fantastic. Okay, so poetry. Um, I, was, I know from both reading and from talking to you that the genesis of this book very much came about during COVID, during a time of kind of obsessive reading. Um, I do feel like genre is actually a construct invented by bookstores, and there is no such thing, and we're just artists making books. Yeah. But it's also, I think, scary for people who have mainly been studying one medium, working in one medium, to kind of tr cross over in the way you have. And so I was wondering if you could talk about maybe both the journey you took from poetry to fiction and the research you did, which I know is very extensive, and then maybe a second question, if you feel up to it, would be how poetry informed the prose in this book. Yeah, oh, that's beautiful. I like the generosity of that second part of that question. After the brutalism of the first part. <laughs> no, 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 well, the first part, I mean, like, yeah, I mean the the what Adam is alluding or Professor Galvin is alluding to uh, is um, that when I was writing this book, you know, I've, I've called myself a poet my whole life um, since I was like 13, 14. I've been like, I'm a poet. That's what I am to the world. That's what I'll be. I thought that that meant I would be living in tuberculosis squalor in like a garret on top of a coal mine or something, you know, but. Um, but I was happy to, you know, like if that, like if that's what a life in letters cost, then that's what I would do, right? And I just spent the next 20 years or so um, hold up in the 815 section of a library, right? Like stopping only to like drink and do drugs and then get sober. Um, uh, but I would still like that 815 section of the library was like the bedrock upon which my entire life has been and was built. And so when I realized that these like little Lucy drafts that I was writing were, um, were I, I called it like a fiction thing until it was like you know sixty thousand words, and then I was like, all right, maybe I'm writing a novel. Um, but uh, uh, as soon as I realized that I was writing a fiction thing, um, I didn't want to assume the hubris of you know thinking that because I could write a poem. I could write a novel, right? In fact, I think that poetry, in my experience, is closer to dance or statuary um, or sculpture or pottery, and novel writing feels far closer to symphony or uh, or screenwriting, movie writing or um, playwriting or um, those longer moments. Anyways. Um, and so I, yeah, I put myself on this sort of narrative diet of flog rod ducking narrative into myself, right? Of um, uh, I would read two novels a week and watch a movie a day, um, and uh, and yeah, I mean it wasn't like to call it research would imply that there was some 
our full curation of that experience, right? Whereas I was truly, truly, truly just like, I just wanted to, you know, I would watch how Antonioni showed how a person getting yelled at, like what they did with their hands, right? And then I would um, watch Pineapple Express to find out how a writer gets characters through doorways and how they explain like how they got their money to get on a flight to get some, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like the architectonics of this shit is what I didn't know. You know, like I know how to make, you know, wizened characters speak to each other in oracular bon mots, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? And like, just like utter gnomic wisdoms to each other in this sort of mm, miasmic nebulous cloud of pretty language, right? But what I wanted to write was like a book with a, like just like a meat and potatoes plotty book. And the plot of this book is like super, just straight forward, like, it's like a hero's journey. The guy lives home, he encounters obstacles, discovers mysteries, unravels mysteries about himself and his path. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like it is like, the, the, the form may be a little unconventional, but the, but the actual, if you map the actual narrative out, it's about as traditional as you can get. Yeah, yeah the Vonnegut thing, right? Um, and so, uh, yeah, I just, I just wanted to figure out how it had been done, and I stole from everybody. Mm -hmm. And what about as, as you were, st how do you get people through doorways? Uh, it's hard, yeah, really hard. There's this, um, I, I heard this story about uh, Derek Walcott teaching a playwriting class. Um, and I think about it all the time, although Derek Walcott wasn't a very good guy, maybe he shouldn't be sort of, but you know, I think we're all ethically mature enough to separate them. Anyways, um, but, uh, but he, so someone was taking his class and they had written this poem about, or not a poem, sorry, they had written this play, like a one act play about uh, these two people trapped in a cage and they were having all of these sort of uh, big, you know, moving spiritual, philosophical conversations with each other. And then, you know, and, and that was like the entirety of the play, right? They're trapped in a cage having these big philosophical conversations with each other. And they read it out loud in class, the student, and Derek Walcott just says, no one will care about what they have to say unless they know where they piss and shit, right? <laughs> Uh, and and like and like you know it's it's crass, but I think about that all the yeah. time, right? Is like if you're writing narrative fiction, narrative prose, right? Like the the mechanics have to be there, and they have to be sound. You know, like you you look at Toni Morrison's journals, and you see she had drawn blueprints of all the houses, you know, the houses of each of the characters, so that she would know like what door you know, uh, people of Green Love was walking through to get to the front, you know what I'm saying? Like, like all of these, you know, the, the, the sort of hidden mechanics of the novel are so important and the reader will feel their accents if they're not there. Though, if they're there, artfully, hopefully they won't notice their presence, right? Which is this like incredibly difficult thing that again, like poetry had not prepared me in any way for. You know, there's no, I mean, I guess you sort of move the camera around in four dimensions in poetry. You zoom in and zoom out, and also zoom forward and backwards through time with these sort of, uh, I don't know, like uh, adverbial clauses or prepositional clauses. But you understand what I'm saying, right? There's no real equivalent of that sort of narrative work in poetry, unless you're writing very narrative poetry, which is not really um, what I have done for you. So like, you know, you're learning this form, and, and one thing I think I always turned to your poetry for was the way you combine a sort of searing honesty, but also ekphrasis, writing about art, um, and also I think using different kinds of tales and stories. There's a, a, a story in this book that has really stuck with me since I read it, and, and you were mentioning the kind of unusual sequencing that the book has. Um, although it has a hero's journey, it, it's very polyvocal. You get a lot of different characters talking. Yeah. Uh, the story is, uh, and I wonder if you might say it better than me, it's about a, a mirror, uh, and, and the mirror fractures, yeah. and is made more beautiful. And I was thinking of the fractured mirror as sort of a metaphor for this project, where oh, yeah. you have all these different shards that all reflect Cyrus, but yeah. they all are also in some way forming a greater whole than a mirror could. 100%. Yeah, I love that. I, so. I mean, this is true. Uh, I'm Iranian. I was born in Iran, and um, and 
obviously am interested in the history of Iranian art. And so like in the olden times, um, uh, the, the Sultan would send these, the Sultan of Persia would send these uh, explorers out to Europe to investigate and to find all these, you know, to build these diplomatic relations with uh, the European continent. And um, one time they saw these great mirrors and felt, you know, like these multi-story tall mirrors in, uh, you know, Austria and Hungary and uh, France. And, uh, and they came back and told the Sultan, like, oh my God, they have these like multi-story mirrors, right? Um, and so he was like, great. Go bring me some, and uh, and so they go back. But as you may know, mirrors can break. They're made of what is functionally glass, um, and uh, and especially when you're traveling, you know, across many many nations and you know many many miles on like camel or horseback, right? Um, it's hard to bring many story tall mirrors, you know, across the world. And so they all, so they bring them back, but they arrive all shattered in like these these tiny, tiny little pieces, which is, and so they gave them to the mosaic artists of the mosques, and uh, and this is like the genesis of all the Persian mirror art that you may, you know, uh, you might have seen some of it, um, but this is the genesis of like all the sort of mirror niches in Persian mosques, um, and. You know, they, they had to do something with all of this sort of shattered mirror glass. Um, the, there's an artist character in the book who proposes that this means that uh, that the Persians got to Cubism centuries before Brock or Picasso or anyone in Europe called it Cubism, right? This idea of looking at these, uh, gathering these sort of multivalent portraits of yourself, right? These these um, many mirrored portraits of yourself. And, there's a way to, I was really interested in, so, you know, I read you guys that first section, if you believe that the light bulb's flash was in fact God telling Cyrus that he exists or whatever, then that makes Cyrus something of a prophet, right? That makes Cyrus something of a, you know, a, if, if you have like a direct channel with God, right, uh, that makes you something of a prophet or a saint. Or, I, there's this um, there's a story in the Kabbalah in, in Kabbalah's tradition where um, at any given moment there are 36 saints on the planet Earth, um, and 35 of them have like a direct line of communication, can hear God in their head at any moment, telling them to do the right thing telling them like at any given moment like what is the correct thing that I should be doing. And then the 36th doesn't have God in their head, doesn't have that line of communication, but still just organically does all the right things. I'm getting used to talking about this. Uh, but just still like because of their like impeccable, flawless nature, just does all the right things anyways. And at any given moment on the planet Earth, there's one sort of like perfect saint, and then the 35 saints with that direct line of communication. And anyways, I, um, the idea of Cyrus being on this prophet's journey sort of turns the entirety, if you, if you read it that way, there's a way to read the entire novel as that. Um, and this is why you only ever see, I mean, this is like a military shit, but being a little self indulgent right now. We want craft. No, sure, sure, sure. You guys are assembled here to sort of hear me um, naval base. But, uh, but um, so, so there's a reason why you get this sort of like cubist orbital view of Cyrus, but you never hear from Cyrus in the first person except for those bits quoted from like what's your on his hard drive, or you know, all everyone else's pieces are written in the first person, and then the pieces that follow Cyrus are in the third person. Um, so it becomes like paleographic, right? You know, it's like the, the the narrative of a saint, the narrative of a prophet, right? Um, you know, if you read the New Testament, it's not Jesus being like, and then I still the waters of Galilee, and then I, you know what I mean? Like it is, it is his friends telling the stories about what Jesus did, right? It is his followers and his companions telling us, right? And so I like the idea of, I, I just, I like that mode of creating a character, you know, like uh, sort of triangling their identity off the foils of these other, which is also why we have 
extended conversations with Lisa Simpson and Craig Abdul Jamar and Rumi and you know like 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 this idea of sort of refracting a person's subjectivity off of the foils of these other subjectivities, right? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just endlessly fascinated by that. I mean, it even borders on like a solecism, which is like an intentional yeah. mistake a couple times yeah. when like you're in this close third. And there's maybe three paragraphs, I know there's two in the book, where you kind of head hop all of a sudden when we're in a close third and you just describe him from the other character's perspective. And these were moments where I felt like there was actually some pyrotechnic craft decision making going on here. Uh, some intentionality with almost, there's also, I'm not gonna spoil it, but there's a big secret in the book and the secret is essentially a misreading. So like, like I read it and was like, oh my god, did he leave something out? And then like three pages later, you were like, yeah. da da. Yeah. And so you do play, I think, with like this idea that like you're not quite following like the Jane Austen realist <laughs> character, yeah. even when you're in the close third. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the pyrotechnics to which you allude um, were born out of just dozens of drafts of every scene, right? And and recognizing that there are little. Uh, little moments where, and, and you know, sometimes it'll, it'll it'll sort of be like halfway there too, where I'll be like, Cyrus, imagine what she would have some, what she would have seen looking at him. She would have seen a blah blah blah, blah. right? Which is like sort of like the two, uh, you know, sort of halfway to what between what you're saying, the full cheat and the you know, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's like it's you get this whole new tool set and you read the Bakov or Morrison or you read. Whoever you know, like Faulkner or Cisneros or Marquez or Borges, you know, like the the real, real titans who are just like speaking their own language. Practically, you know, they're not speaking. You know, Dickinson didn't speak English; he spoke Dickinson, right? Morrison didn't speak English; he spoke Morrison, right? You know, like the real, real titans sort of have their own sound, and and like recognizing just like the just like kinetically, architectonically, you can think of. The poem is a small machine made out of words, and the novel is a large machine made out of words, right? Like the like, what is what is in the machine that is making them? What is in the machine that lets them speak their own language that is still legible to me, who only speaks English and is trying to learn to speak that far? You know what I'm saying? Um, uh, and you know that is that is something that people that I love do sometimes, and so I was like, let me try that. You know. See, I think. I have a, a follow-up, but you did mention, I think the audience will perk up with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Lisa Simpson. And so the book has this kind of refrain where in his imaginations, he usually imagines a character from the novel talking to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Lisa Simpson, uh, a very thinly veiled Donald Trump. <laughs> his name never appears in the book. But it's, it's him. <laughs> and so I'm wondering, like, that to me also felt this kind of choral effect of that. I was wondering if you could talk about it. Because so much of this for students, I think, is to say, like, what can you do and what can you get away with? Yeah. And, and you're really playing in those sections. Yeah, I love that. Well, and, and like, truly, like, I am aware that you're not supposed to put dreams in a 21st century English language novel. Like, I am aware that the audience rolls their eyes and sees it as bloat and, or, like, self indulgent or you know what I mean like that, that's not lost sometimes like uh I'll talk about those sections and then I'll see like the audience sort of like like oh shit does he know you know what I mean like yeah I'm like I'm aware but it's also um I dreams are really important to me like I I'm fascinated by the fact that we spend a third of our lives with our brains just staging these productions for us. I'm fascinated by sleep. Like, I mean, I talk about this in the book, but like the idea that you just like lie down and pretend to be asleep until you are is weird. You know what I mean? Like, you, like it's weird that, like we don't do that with anything else, right? You don't do that with, like imagine if in order to drink this, I first had to be like, Ugh? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like for real, like that's what we do with sleep. Like you just pretend to do it over, you know, until it starts happening and you don't really have a lot of control over it. Um, it's so bizarre. And then your brain stages these productions for you, uh, filled with, you know, with all the actors or people that you've loved or people that you've seen in the market or like people that you've had a crush on or people that you didn't know you had a crush on, right? And 
it's like the most fascinating thing in the world and we're not supposed to talk about it. And we spend a third of our lives there, right? Um, I think I'm right on this one. Uh, but, uh, you know, every morning I, I wake up when I'm home and I ask my spouse if they've dreamt because if they have, I get to spend, I get to start my day with my favorite person telling me a story. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's awesome. Um, so anyway, so I, these dreams are important to me in this way of sort of like, so it's always Cyrus's dreams, and it's Cyrus imagining people that he loves talking to sort of fake people that he'll never know. You know, like Rumi has a conversation with his dead dad, and uh, Lisa Simpson has a conversation with his dead mom. And you know, uh, his he he imagines like a fake little brother that he never had, who has like an extended conversation with Kareem Abdul Jabbar because Cyrus also likes basketball. This is a basketball player from the 80s, I think. Yeah. Yes. Um, you guys know Kareem Abdul Jabbar. Do you, do you guys? You know, really? That's crazy. We're very old, my friend. Holy shit. I've never, like, I, like, sometimes you guys will be talking about, like, this or that musician. You guys, I just mean, like, my students. No, shame. Um, no, 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 truly. I mean, it's just, it happens to the, it'll happen to you, too. But, uh, <laughs> but, like, sometimes my students will be talking about, like, this or that musician, and I'm like, that's fine. Like, I, I'm good. But, like, that's nuts. Like, like, that's, like, one of, okay. Um, uh, what am I talking about? Uh, oh yeah, so so, but it's always Cyrus, and so what I wanted to do was study texts that have taken dreams seriously that readers seem fine with, <laughs> for real, you know. And so like reading like Chuka Lahiri, who is an author who takes dreams very seriously, or um, Jorge, uh, the uh, is an Argentinian writer who is one of my favorite writers ever, um, takes dreams very seriously, and even like. Like The Sopranos, uh, I'm in New Jersey, um, is a show that takes uh, is a show that takes dreams very seriously, right? Um, there's an is it, does anyone mind me giving uh, like fairly early season Sopranos spoilers? You're nodding. All right, give real quick. All right, great. Uh, so uh, listen, I warned you. I feel like that was pretty generous. <laughs> oh, for real? Are you? Is this? No, I'm, I'm actually, go on, just do no, it. No, for real, I'm a petulant toddler about spoilers, too. It's actually no joke, one of the, I mean, I don't mean to say two, like, because that is sort of tacitly calling a petulant toddler about spoilers. It wasn't like, even tacit. Uh, yeah, I guess it wasn't even tacit. But no, I, like, truly, this is, like, one of the great uh, crisis points of my marriage, is that my, you said yours, too? Oh. Um, uh, no, for real, for real, because like uh, my spouse just d like my spouse will like read the Wikipedia entry for a movie before we go and see it, which is like psychopathic. Yeah, um, yeah right. Yeah. Uh, at the, I wish they were here. Yeah, I know. Honestly, uh, transcendent American poet Paige Lewis, feel free to at them and share your thought. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, yeah. Anyways, um, are you are, for real? Are you okay with this? It's not, it's not like a major. Just do it. Okay, I'm just gonna do it. I'm sorry. I listen. I. I sincerely, as you, I'm sorry. Uh, so in, in, I don't even remember, it's, it's an early season though. Um, and also like, in like 25 years, it's like the statute of limitations. Um, uh, okay, uh, what am I talking about? Oh, right, right, right. So, so uh, Sopranos takes dreams seriously. Um, uh, there's an episode where Tony is at a fish market and the fish are talking to him, and one of the fish tells him that Big Pussy is a rat. And Tony doesn't know this knowledge in real life. He's trying to figure out who the rat is in real life. And the fish tells him, and then he acts on that, and is right, right? And so there, there's a way in which the show earns the right to tell you dreams by revealing narrative data to you within the dream before it is revealed to the characters in their regular consciousness. And that's something that I blatantly stole from my book, right? It's like I like there is narrative data that happens in the dreams of my book that uh, precedes Cyrus's conscious awareness of that data. So there are central mysteries in the book to which I've alluded that Cyrus is working through, and he gets a little bit ahead within the dreams than he gets in his consciousness, right? Which is how. One of the ways that I hope the dreams sort of earn their place and don't feel bloaty and don't feel sort of self-indulgent is that 
you get this little kernel of you know recognizing the science is figuring this out, right? So um, you know, for all my like high-minded like wishing that I could only be like I don't actually wish this, but like you know, I think that a version of me would like to only be up here like quoting Flaubert and you know and uh, Proust or whatever, but like the Soprano is like very directly influenced. Um, uh, who's the guy who wrote the Soprano? Um, David Chase. David Chase. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So shout out David Chase for uh, uh, indulging my of the main. So earlier. You mentioned, when you were talking about the mirror, um, Europe. And this book has a very beautiful line about Europe, that when we call the West the West and the East the East, we're being Eurocentric. Yeah, um, yeah. And yeah, like, like the Earth is a sphere, right? Like, the, the, like we only live in the West, and the Middle East is only the Middle East, and the Far East is only the Far East of the center of Europe. Because, and, and like, the, I, I, like, I really, really hate that. Like, like, I don't like the term Western values or Western whatever. And so culturally, the book has centers, but it also is very, I think, ecstatic in how it draws in, in a very decentralized way, art and martyrs from all yeah. traditions and all cultures. Yeah. And so I mentioned the word ekphrasis earlier, which is the writing of art in a work of art. And I was wondering if you could talk about that sort of decentered, de european approach I think you take to yeah. writing about art and writing in this book? Yeah, that's such a good question. Thank you. It's not a small thing to read a book as well as you can do. Um, uh, so I think that, like, I mean, so I think that, yeah, I mean, so prior to putting this book out, uh, I wrote, or I edited a book called The Penguin Anthology of Spiritual Verse, 110 Poets on the Divine. Um, and for that, I read 43 centuries of poetry, not just from America and Europe, but from uh, Aboriginal Antipodian poets and from Mesoamerican indigenous poets and Sub-Saharan African poets and Caribbean poets. You know, um, uh, I read a lot of poetry because if you are doing 43 centuries of spiritual verse, that doesn't mean like a bunch of you know 16th through 19th century British people and then like maybe Rumi and Sappho for color. Right, which is how a lot of those anthologies have existed. I mean, I don't mean to, you know, uh, Jane Hirschfeld has a great anthology called Women and Race of the Sacred um, that, uh, that was very much a uh, precedent to mine, or very much like a book that I feel from that book to mine. But I say this to say that, like, you know, just recognizing that, you know, uh, Dante and Rumi were alive at the same time. Right, like, the, like we talk about us living in a golden age, right? I mean, who's not talking about it? Like, there was a day on the planet Earth when Dante and Rumi were looking at the same moon. Like, if that doesn't just like pulverize you, uh, like, yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, and so like recognizing that all of these questions and uncertainties and skepticisms and doubts and fervent exhortations of belief and fear and wonder at the possibility of a divine, the possibility of meaning, um, the possibility of there not being a divine, recognizing that the divine has taken many forms, including land, including justice, including beauty. Um, uh, it's not always like a capital G God who sits in a cloud and strokes his beard and gets mad and really lied, right? Like, it, it, like the, the divine has taken a lot of different shapes throughout history. Um, and it would be, it just feel, it doesn't even feel like, well, I mean, I think it is unethical to represent, like, if you're talking about the fullness of human history or the history of art. Uh, to just talk about your humor, but more than that, it just feels very provincial. You know what I mean? Like it feels very like, you know, like if the only paper that you ever read was like the uh, New Brunswick Daily Bugle. Or, I'm sorry, I don't know what the paper is called. So like, um, pretty close. Yeah, <laughs> but, but like you've got really <laughs> pretty close. It's a Daily Targum. Oh, it's a, it's a Daily Targum. Targum. T A R G U M. Oh, is it Targum? It's never oh. was never been confirmed to me. Okay, whatever. It doesn't, I mean, so like, if the only paper that you guys read was the New Brunswick Daily Targum, 
uh, which I'm sure is a fine paper with great recordings. But but like but if that's the only paper that you read, you know a lot about New Brunswick, you know a little about New Jersey and maybe a little bit of the world, but you wouldn't know anything about like you wouldn't know shit about the rest of the world. You know what I mean? Uh, you might know about like the headliniest, like worst things that were happening, right? And that is, you know, 97% of the literature that is published, or that is that is written rather today, like right now, is not originally composed in English, right? And yet, how much of the writing that you read in the past five years, what, it, it, that me, I don't mean to say like you and like I am sitting in this place of purity, right? How much of the writing that we've read in the past five years was originally composed in English, right? And you know, like we have translations, right? We can very easily do, you know, you can, I say this to say that provinciality is something that um, I try to push back again. Like that's something that I try to push back against in my actual life, and um, certainly that doing that anthology of spiritual verse helped me recognize just how big the conversation is, and how many sort of like confluences there were, and how many people were saying the same things at different times or at the same times in different places, and how much we've all been talking the same for forty three centuries. Um, and so, if that is if that sense is present in this book, it's because of I think another thing that the book I think really deals with brilliantly when it comes to this question of provinciality is the uh, the real life air disaster uh, six five five, um, which the, the book goes through a sort of chorus, uh, and maybe you can contextualize it for the audience of it too. The book goes through a chorus of American voices rationalizing the shooting down of this uh, Iranian passenger airline with. Uh, well, with the 300 people aboard or so? Yeah, yeah. At, and um, you use that, and it's counterpointed with the fact that Cyrus's mom is on the yeah. plane. So you have George H.W. Bush saying, I will never apologize for America, while in yeah, the same yeah. breath you have someone losing his mother. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in 1980, on July 3rd, 1988, the USS Vincennes was stationed in the Persian Gulf and shoots down a civilian Iranian airliner and Iranian airplane. 655, Iran Airplane 655, um, killing all 290 people on board, including 66 children. Um, those of you of a certain age will remember the Vincennes incident, right? And you might flip through your psychic Rolodex and, you know, you'll be like, oh yeah, that was the instance of American atrocity that affected Iran. You know, and you might, you might be able to like pin it to that, but like the fact that those of you who had never heard of this incident didn't immediately like whip out your phones and be like, no way that happened. Like I would have definitely heard about that if that right is testament to the fact that the imprecision of American justice is just taken for a hit. It's just taken, you know, we just we just assume that, you know, the the unpleasant but necessary cost of being a global military superpower is that uh, every so often we're gonna accidentally shoot two hundred and ninety people out of the sky, right? Um, I mean, it was a civilian airliner, just like the plane that I took to get here today. It was not operating on any military frequencies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and Adam alluded to a quote by then Vice President for Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, whose daughter now has a book club. Um, who, uh, granddaughter. Uh, granddaughter, sorry, granddaughter. Now has a book club wherein they interview uh, some of our very, very greatest authors and sort of culturally launder their uh, war criminal heiress, which is sorry, um, but uh, sorry, she's no. a sponsor. Uh, We're okay, okay. I'm not sorry. Um, uh, but uh, but I say this to say, uh, then Vice President George H. W. Bush said, um, "I don't care what the facts are. I'm not going to apologize for America's sort of guy." That was a quote. I don't care what the facts are. I'm not an apologize for America's sort of guy. Um, the what what feels to me like an ethical crisis is that I say 290 people, but if it was 295, it wouldn't be any different. Like it wouldn't qualitatively be any different to my mind, right? Like 290 is a middle large number. It's more than seven. It's fewer than 10,000. Right. Um, I mean, we feel, we feel this right now in Gaza, right? Like you see the daily death 
count, you, right now it's 11,500 11, children who have been murdered in Gaza, right? 11,500. If it was 11,501, right? Would that make a qualitative difference to that value in your mind? Like if it was 11,499. But think about like the child in, you, in your life who you love. Like the child, in, you know, you all have a child in your life who you love, right? Like that's how much those ele that's how those 11,500 kids were loved. You know what I mean? Like that that's how they were loved, right? And so the fact that Dana is like utterly abstracted feels it's not a moral failure because you know I'm, I'm yoked to my brain, but it is a moral crisis, right? And I think that narrative art, one of the channels of action in all of this is that narrative art can present the granular, singular experience of an individual subjectivity. And then when you see that, you can lay it over the abstraction of a collective grief, right? And so like this book, everything that happens in this book happens because Cyrus's mom was on Iran Air Flight 655, right? Like every single, you know, every, class that Cyrus takes in college, every person that Cyrus fucks, right? Like all of their lives are indelibly inflected by the fact that in 1988, the USS Vincennes shot Iran Air Flight 655 out of the sky, right? And so when you see that, when you see the effect that one incident has 30 years later on all of these people who are like so many steps removed from the incident, and then you extend that to you multiply that by like 289, right, or 290, you're like, oh shit, like those, I'm probably affected by those ripples, you know what I'm saying? And then when you think about like 11,500 kids in Gaza, right, the utter abstraction of that, but when you see like an Instagram video that was like, here's what she loved, she loved horses, and she loved dark chocolate, and she loved hanging out with her big brother, you know, that subjectivity reminds you that all 11,500 of those were individual human beings, right? And and that is that is what art can do, right? Art gives us a granular subjective experience that you can use and you can feel in a qualitative, emotional way. And then you can lay that over the utter abstraction of quantitative data. Right, like nonfiction, Marilyn Robinson writes about this a lot, but nonfiction struggles in a way that fiction doesn't with empathy, and empathy yeah. seems to me, and not just easy empathy, but like the core project of empathy in this book, uh, he begins as essentially a medical actor, uh, which is trying to teach doctors to be more empathetic. Um, the, his sponsor is in some ways an incredibly empathetic person, and is in other ways very unempathetic, and, and there is no perfect empathy, right? And so I was wondering, like, we're told often as kind of a chestnut, essentially, that empathy is like the foundational basis of fiction. This book seems very interested in examining that question and using this real life disaster, uh, atrocity, um, I think does very interesting work with this question of empathy. Yeah, yeah, well, hmm. yeah, I, that's, that's a fascinating provocation. Um, Maybe what I can say is that from the vantage point of the people in Gaza right now, my rage about what is happening in Gaza feels comparatively luxurious. You know what I mean? Um, from the vantage point of the actual families of those 290 people killed on Iran Air Flight 655, my outrage looks incredibly comfortable. You know, I think this is one of the important lessons that BLM sort of brought Absolutely. to the American, to the to the American consciousness, right? Is that from the vantage point of one port, one person's mortal terror and fear for their fear for their own and their beloved safety, your righteous indignation, your um, outrage, your uh, you know insulted sense of justice, is a profound privilege, right? Mm -hmm. And so the delta between you know, like during the during COVID, um, Iran had one of the worst rates of uh, per capita COVID deaths because US sanctions made it so that during the first phase, 
excuse me, ventilators couldn't get into Iran. And then once vaccines were developed, U.S. sanctions made it so that the vaccines couldn't get into Iran until they brokered deals with China and Russia. But um, from the vantage, like this pissed me off so much, right? Like I was, I was furious about this. But I had relatives and friends over there who died. Right. You like not like who knew people who like they died, right? Like I have relatives who died, and so like. You know, like from the vantage point of me sitting here with like a microphone in front of my face and like staying in a nice hotel, like I have to leverage that into something, right? right? Like I have to, there's like a delta between me and my family members who died or lived in fear for 18 months and couldn't leave their houses once, right? Um, and this is one channel of action, right? It's right. not the only channel of action that right. I take, but you know, it is a way to leverage my meager skill set, right? You know, all of my interests and skills in this world are concentrated into this one tiny little dot way out in the margins of human interest, right? Um, but this is the best way that I've found to sort of leverage them. And, and so maybe continuing in this vein, Dr. Gay's book, Hunger, is to me one of the great examinations of the linkages between trauma and addiction. Um, yeah. And if you haven't read it, it's, it's like a really sensational book. Uh, this book has this like foundational trauma. Uh, I don't think Cyrus is interested in justifying his addiction. He experiences it. But I was interested in the ways in which the book essentially stacks trauma onto him. And he also is suffering and, yeah. uh, and is addicted, as, as you read, uh, mainly to alcohol, but also to kind of everything else. And so, you know, I think this book is like, like William Styron, there, there are great books of addiction and sometimes the linkages between addiction and trauma. Were you, were you in conversation with those books on addiction and thinking about the role of trauma? Yeah, I mean, of course, you know, I've read Hunger and loved it for the reasons that you describe and for others. And I've read, you know, if there's a great book of addiction literature, I've probably read, you know, just over the course of my own being in the center of a very specific Venn diagram of like the literary world and the recovery world, right? Um, uh, but it's also like, I mean, I always think about this in terms of influence, and I'm sure that, you know, you have a similar feeling. So I, I referenced Borges earlier, who's um, one of my, uh, Jorge Luis Borges, um, who's one of my very favorite, right? B O R G. Even more important than Karim Abdul Jabbar. Yeah, barely. You know, they're, like, they're, they're, up, they're like both pantheon guys for me, but actually, that's an interesting, like, like, it's a good like who takes up more, like, just literal, like, neural real estate for me? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, but not the question that you asked. Um, uh, so, Borges, Argentinian writer, he was really obsessed with this, these ideas of infinity. Um, those, maybe some of you have read him, you know what I'm talking about, but, you know, he has stories like The Book of Sand or The Library of Babel, where he's sort of approximating these different visions of infinity. And one of his favorite ways of conceiving of infinity was the Sahara Desert. Um, you know, like the number of the grains of sand in the desert, you know, relative to the size of the whole desert, you know, it's not infinity. In fact, it's infinitely smaller than infinity, but still, you know, about as close as our minds can conceive of something like infinity. He was also a little bit of an Orientalist, but I think I'm allowed to forgive him for that. Like, I think that's how that, I think that's how that works. Um, but, uh, but anyways, late in his life, uh, he's either going blind or he is blind, and I, I, I should read up on the story before telling it. But um, uh, he gets to go to the Sahara, um, and he, you know, he gets there, and he, they take him to the desert, and the first thing that he does when he gets there is he reaches down, and he scoops up a palm full of sand, and he lets it sift through his fingers like this, and he's like, I'm modifying the star. Right? I'm getting goosebumps talking about it. And that was like this great epiphany. And I think it's just one of the most beautiful things. I like like his being there made the Sahara forever different than it ever would have been, you know, even if in that fractional way, right? And so like in the same way, every book that I've ever read has modified my Sahara, so to speak, right? Like the first time I read The Bluest Eye, it was like people of Breedlove like brought in the dump trucks and made a whole new archipelago in there, right? The first time I read Leslie Jameson's The Recovery, which I think is a great contemporary work of uh, recovery literature. 
Um, it was like that. Whereas, like the book about pirates that teach you about water buoyancy that I read to my younger niece over FaceTime uh, of last weekend, maybe just moved a few grains of sand here to there. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I knew most of what it was trying to teach about water buoyancy already. Um, but but you know, but it's still like it's not inert, you know, and it's all in there. It's not like the like the croissant that I ate for breakfast two days ago is like in here somewhere, you know, like the lipids from it are like doing lipid shit, right? Uh, in here somewhere. Yeah. But I can't point to them, right? And that's how I feel about like anytime I'm thinking I mean, I guess I did just point to like a specific Sopranos influence or whatever, but the vast majority of these things are just sort of like they're in there modifying the Sahara, terraforming the Sahara, and like what comes out is indelibly inflected by them, but I wouldn't be able to like be like, oh, here's the William Styron section and here's the, you know, uh, Baldwin section from when you could like in his later work when who was the editor that said you could hear the ice clinking in his glass, right? Like the the you know, like the um, uh, you know, I, there are all of these, you know, the Berryman section and the whatever, whatever, right? Um, all of these authors who, with whom I've spent so much time are obviously inflecting the way that my semantic algorithms move, right? Yeah. But I couldn't point to the spot. I think, I think that's just such an argument for reading widely. And, you know, that's what we all should be doing. And, and I actually always am nervous when someone's writing a book and they say, well, I'm only going to read very narrowly about the subject of my book sure. for a year. Um, yeah, I, go on. Uh, it's also, oh, sorry, I just, I, my mom, like every like since we came to America, my mom would just go to the library and like pick up the books on the like recently checked in area and bring them home. And so I would be reading a book about like Algin Baylor, and then I would read of Mice and Men, and then I would read a book about botany. And, you know what I mean? Like for real, I'm not making this up. Like and that's just like how I read my entire life, like like the first the first 18 years of my life. And I still kind of think it's how I read. Like I I'll read any magazine about anything. The magazine is my favorite literary genre, but you know, like even books, like I'll read pretty much anything. I love how many Lakers players from before 1990 you're mentioning. <laughs> Elgin Baylor is a Lakers player Wait, from the 60s. About, you want to know my, uh, so I, I wasn't making, like I really do remember reading like a little like kid's biography of Elgin Baylor, but I remember that it said that he scored 71 points, and I think I must have misread it because like Will Chamberlain had his 101 point game before Elgin Baylor had his 71 point game. But, or maybe, maybe it's vice versa, because like I, I either misread it or it was like such an old book that that was, I can't remember which order it happened, but I I came away from the book believing that Elgin Baylor had the most points ever in the history of a basketball game with 71, which Joel and me just did this season. Um, but uh, but and so like when I was playing pickup with my friends, there was like a several year long period where I was like, I'm Elgin Baylor. When they were like, I'm Ray Allen, I'm Allen Iverson, you know, I was like, I'm Elgin Baylor, and uh, and everyone would be like, what? And and now I'm still sort of like what. Tempted though I am to follow you in this, we both love this. Sorry, I want to follow you down, no, but sure, I'm going to sure. stay up here. Sure. Um, and then maybe, maybe after this question, we'll start thinking about student questions. Yeah. So, audience uh, questions. Pardon yeah, me. Yeah. You can ask us whatever you want. But here's one from me. This is a very giddily bisexual book. Uh, <laughs> you, I love that expression. It is right. Yeah. I mean, every character yeah. I think could have sex with every other character in this yeah. book. Um, yeah. I love that as sort of like a potentiality field for a novel. Yeah. I was wondering if you could talk about it. Yeah, thank you. I feel like people are afraid to talk to me about this. Uh, like I'm married to a femme non-binary person. I've never gone on the record saying anything about anything. You know, like I, I'm, uh, and I feel like people are like, I don't know, it's been, because it's like not an insignificant part of the book, but no one ever talks to me about it. Um, yeah, uh, I, so I'm going to come to it, but I'm gonna, I, I promise I'm going to land this plane. So in the second half of the 20th century, there are these, well, you guys know Achebe, like Chinua Achebe, the great Nigerian writer, um, uh, who was like, you know, again, like Nabokov or Morrison or O'Connor or, you know, like just one of the great sort of pro stylists of the 20th century. Like you could hang one of his sentences in, a, in the Louvre, you know what I mean? Like he's one of those sorts of authors who you could just like turn a sentence in the sun and just catch something new about it every time. Um, and then there was this other author who I really, really, really love, who a lot of people have mixed feelings about, 
um, named Amos Tutuola, who wrote a book called The Palm Wine Drinker. I love that book. Yeah, me too, oh me too. Um, and so like, the Palm Wine, and, and he was sort of a contemporary of Achebe, they were writing around the same time. Um, Tutuola was almost like exactly the opposite kind of author of Achebe, where like, Achebe takes the, this, this European form, the novel, and masters it, and then uses it to ironize the colonial tongue, right? Like he 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 speaks better English than the the colonists, you know what I mean? Uh, and and takes their medium and like turns it against them to sort of ironize their gaze on Africa broadly. Whereas Tutuola is kind of just indifferent, you know? He's kind of just like like his the palm wine drinker is full of these like bizarre sentences that like have uh, unconventional grammars and unconventional spellings throughout and the narrative is really loopy and nothing happens, you know, like you expect it's gonna build to something and then he'll just like resolve something in a sentence and move on to something else, you know, like it's one of the weirdest books you'll ever read. And yeah, and and when it came out, all his contemporaries were like, no, 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 we don't sound like that. Like we, like we know how to talk English. Like you know, like because it was like an, they saw it as like embarrassing to them, right? Like it was like, and they were all like, no, we know how to. Like this is, I don't know what he's doing, but like we all talk English, you know. And there's there's just this utter unself consciousness about that, where. I mean, I, there's, I, I've sort of now created this spectrum from Achebe to Tutuola, and that doesn't exist, you know, they're both exemplars of doing different things, and there's no sense of, like, opposition that I'm not trying to create this scenario where they're sort of antagonistic to each other. Um, but I love Achebe, but I also love Tutuola, and I love Tutuola's just utter ambivalence to the colonial gaze, you know what I mean? Like, just like, I'm gonna tell my Yoruba folk tales, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna tell them in the way that I want to tell them, and like I'm gonna call it a novel. And like you can, that's if you want to read it, that's dope. If you don't want to read it, that's cool. Like I'm gonna tell the stories, you know. And I feel like that sort of ambivalence feels very punk to me, mm -hmm. and also very like Cyrus is troubled by a great many things in this book, but he is not troubled by like. The fact that sometimes he sucks dick. You know what I mean? Like, he's not, you know, and I think that that is the reality of a lot of people in the world, right? You know, like, I think that, well, I, you know, I don't want to put it on a biographical thumb on the scale, but, you know, I, I think that, again, like, there, I think that the utter ambivalence to the dominant sort of uh, heteronormative gaze feels very compelling to me. Absolutely. I think it's a great answer. Okay, audience questions. Some of the Vita and then over here. We'll go across right to left. Uh, yeah, so um, some of these sort of uh, reference this poem that is quoted in the novel. Cyrus uh, references it early on in the novel. It's, uh, it's a poem by Jean Valentine called I Came to You. Um, and shared that the poem is a little bit sort of. Uh, Frustrated with the insufficiency of language in certain ways, um, you said it beautifully. I'm not going to uh, recall exactly what you said, but um, and so talking about how you use language to talk about the, er, uh, and so the question was sort of how do I use language to talk about these big things, and also how would it be different if, if the novel would be different if it was poetry? I, I wouldn't have been able to, to. That's the easy question for me to answer, which is just it wouldn't have existed. Like there's no, I. I, I you know, maybe a better poet than me could have written a sort of long narrative poem that does what this novel does. Um, certainly, long narrative poems exist like that. Back to Gilgamesh, right? Um, but uh, I don't have the stamina for such a project. Um, and my poems are much more sort of, uh, I don't know, they're not very narrative, and uh, certainly not that kind of there. Um, to the, the other point, is a lot is just really interesting to me. Um, so the poem uh, is called, it's called I Came to You by Jean Valentine. Um, the poem in its entirety goes, again, yeah, the title is I Came to You. This is the poem. I came to you, Lord, because of the fucking reticence of the world. No, not the world, not 
residence. Oh, Lord, come. Lord, come. We were sad on the ground. Lord, come. We were sad on the ground. So that's the moment that's tonight. And so, there's this way in which the poem begins in this sort of liturgical register. I came to you, Lord. Right, liturgical meaning like sort of how you go to church, like the language, you go to church and talk to them, whatever. Um, and then because of the fucking reticence of the world, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find a less liturgical word than fucking, right? Um, because of the fucking reticence of the world. No, not the world, not reticence. Oh, Lord, come. Um, Lord, come. Right? And so it's like, shh, there's this rhetorical hesitancy there, right? No, not the world, not reticence. Right? She's like correcting. And this is, this is pure performance, right? Because this is a ball, right? It's not an act of live competition. It's not, this is, you know, she edited this poem, she published it, right? Like there were many steps along the way in which she could have put the right word, you know, if, if there was a right word, right? And so she's performing a kind of rhetorical hesitancy for us. And then, oh, and then all she says after that, oh, is Lord come, Lord come, we were sat on the ground, Lord come, we were sat on the ground, right? So it's like she's tried this liturgical idiom given up on it, tried this more angry, you know, because of the fucking reticence of the world, given up on it, tried this sort of like self-correcting editorial mode, given up on it, and then just says like, oh, Lord, right? And so you have this sensation in this very, very short poem of her giving up on the poem three times within the poem, uh, and then just saying it in the most like utterly plain and elemental way possible, right? Um, Lord come, Lord come, we're sat on the ground, Lord come, we're sat on the ground. There's a way in which that acknowledgement of the insufficiency of language to represent or even really usefully illuminate the crises of our living, um, the way that the poem kind of stumbles before you, performs its own dissolution before you, is like a Rosetta Stone. You know what I mean? And there's a reason the back of the poem that Cyrus remembers because, and you know, again, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil anything for anyone. But the last chapter of the book um, is very, you know, I wrote a hundred drafts of the last, maybe not literally, but definitely like dozens of drafts of the last chapter of the book um, before landing on, uh, and, and different shit happened in all of you know. Like, I'll go back to my home world, and he like it beamed up. In a Are you talking about the last chapter or the afterwards? Oh, sorry, the last, yeah, the last chapter, not the coda, the, yeah. the chapter thirty-two. Um, and the for me, all the art that I love best in this world can be. It's almost like how post-structuralism is a lens, or new criticism is a lens, or like there's the Marxist lens or the feminist. You're right. There's like this lens that I love to look at art through of like, how is this art straining its medium? How is this art showing that the emotional catalytic that brought this piece of art into the world was it utterly, utterly dwarfs, utterly eclipses the representational capacity of the medium? And I think that, you know, you look at, um, you know, time marbling its way in the Sappho, or you look at uh, Coltrane's high C, the irreproducible high C, or you look at, um, Brian Eno talks about the sound of uh, Louis Singer's voice on a vinyl record being the sound of, I think this is in the book, right? um, the sound of witnessing emotional events too momentous for the medium assigned to record them, right? And, and, and any piece of art that I love, you know, like Rodin's stump for its all for soldiers, right, can be seen through how it is signifying the insufficiency of its medium. And I think that the last chapter of the book for me is all about that. Um, and so I kind of forget what your original question was now, sorry. But just, but to sort of like speak to why that poem is sort of like a foreshadowing of what's going to come later. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think this question is a little bit about sort of our living in a fairly secular moment, uh, at least in the sort of um, European American.
in reality. Uh, yeah, I mean, even even the contention. I mean, now I'm really fascinated by this idea of like, are we in the most secular moment in history or post secular moment in history? Um, it's sort of this funny thing of you know because of the population boom in the 20th century um, and how it was sort of disproportionately allocated. Uh, it might be the case that there are now the percentages have shifted towards more net believers, but yeah, anyway, I mean, that's not your question. I, it's just an interesting sidebar that I'll Wikipedia later, but, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the default posture of the public intellectual since the start of the 20th century has been ironic cynicism, secularism, um, to, believe is to be seen as naive, um, to disbelieve is to be seen as progressive. Um, there are reasons for that, you know, the excesses of the church, the temple, the mosque, the everything, right? Um, one of my friends calls Islam uh, the best product of the worst salespeople, uh, which is maybe a little blasphemous for me to repeat, but uh, but, you know, I, mm, I don't know. I mean, again, I'm one, I'm one subjectivity, you know, I'm one unprecedented consciousness, um, writing into my experience of these things. And my experience of these things was being like a fairly low bottom addict who sometimes still trained, you know, and, uh, and sometimes still didn't eat pork, you know, and, um, and when I found out that there were other Muslims who, you know, sucked dick or, you know, drank or, you know, did heroin, that was, that was really exciting to me. And who listened to punk, you know, that was thrilling to me, you know. Um, I had no idea uh, that, you know, I, Michael Muhammad Knight wrote a fictional book called, you know, Michael Muhammad Knight. Yeah, and the Taco Boys, like this idea of Taco and was like so fucking massive. To me. I had no idea. And then, like this fictional book connected me with like the real people who upon whom this fictional book was sort of represented or the, those communities, right? And that was massive to me, right? And now, you know, I'm surrounded by Muslims who do all sorts of zany stuff that are supposed to be haram, but uh, I don't know. I mean, like I'm, I'm not trying to like convince the world that they should believe. I mean, I pray. I'm just as confused as anyone about who that goes to. Um, I think that in the book, Cyrus says that he doesn't feel particularly queer or straight, right? Like each camp thinks that he's too much the other thing. Um, he doesn't feel Muslim or non-Muslim. Everyone thinks that he's too much the other thing. He doesn't feel Iranian or American. You know, like in a room full of Iranians, I feel like at least Iranian person. In a room full of Americans, I feel like certainly never felt particularly American, right? And that liminality can be painful as a person with a body and emotions, but as an artist, it's really powerful, right? That you, you can kind of stand outside of every room and describe the room with a clarity not available to those with their noses pressed up to the mural. Does that for a mixed metaphor? Yeah, those are good questions. I think I had two out of the <laughs> six going into yeah. going into like writing in any serious way. I think I had two out of the six. Um, I don't know. I mean, again, like you know, I mean, you you sound like a much smarter person than me, just broadly. But um, but what I can offer is that I, in my own personal, I'm not saying I, mean, I don't know who this person is. I'm sure they're a, a lovely person, but I'm just very skeptical of certainty. Like I like my, again, as I was talking about, I'm just very very skeptical of anyone who claims to be certain about anything. Um, uh, I think that my lived experience has borne that out pretty exhaustively, right? And so like, anyone who's like, you must know these six things matter, you know, like, you just write, you know what I mean? Like, you just write and you gather up a stack of pages and you write uh, and and you read a lot and you spend a lot of time. I mean, like your library card is worth as much as my degree. You know what I'm saying? Like it's like for real, for real. Like the 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 degree is like a way of forcing you to use your library card. But like you seem currently driven and like you don't need that sort of external capital to 
the spending ads in January. But that's all it is. Like it's, it's yeah, honestly like the most linear thing in the world. Like you spend X hours reading and writing, you get Y better. You know, I used to I used to teach um, intro comp courses at Florida State, uh, which is where I did my PhD. Uh, I never went to like a full school ever. Like I always went to like I mean Florida State, but yeah, it's not like. They're not sending their clients, you know. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, but, uh, um, but like, but like, you know, like, I, and and Florida State was like sixty percent Greek or something like that, like like sixty percent fraternities and sororities, which, um, you know, I'm not yucking anyone else's yum, but uh, for the for the projects that there was like one project where people got to pick what they wrote about. Um, and because of the Venn diagram of the student demographics, it meant that I got a lot of projects about bodybuilding, um, uh, which you know is obviously something that I care deeply about. Mm -hmm. um, but like, I just read so many essays about bodybuilding, and I promise I'm going to land this plane. Uh, one of the things that almost everyone who wrote in those essays said was that uh, a good body is the one thing you can't buy, right? Like you can't buy like a fit, healthy, like big muscle man body, right? And uh, and I was like, you know, I had never thought of that, and that's super true. You know, I mean, maybe you can buy like half implants, but, but like, you know, like no one's gonna- <laughs> Oh my God, what a reference. You said what? That's a reference to, well, that's the craziest episode of TV I've ever seen. Wait, what is it a reference The to? guy who gets calf implants. In what, in what show? It's True Life. There's a full hour about a man. Oh, that's right. Yeah, MTV's True Life. Holy shit. Uh, yeah, I actually think I saw that for real. Because he he like got calf implants, but like everything else was just like a guy. Uh, yeah, um, but that's what I'm saying. Like a, like a good body is like, and and like they all said that, and I was like, this is amazing. I had never considered that, and it seems to be like ubiquitous knowledge amongst the young Greek bodybuilding community, um, uh, which is sizable. I had no idea. Um, but uh, but I think about that all the time with relation to writing too. Is like there's no shibboleth or secret handshake or secret checklist of six things or you know what I mean. Like it's just like you just write a fuck ton, you read a fuck ton more, you just sort of like you do it so much that like it, like everything that enters your consciousness first enters. You know, like when I'm having a fight with my spouse. You know, like they'll accidentally misspeak, and I'll be like, "Oh, like that was kind of interesting." You know, like, mm -hmm. and they'll see me like clocking it, and be like, "You're not even listening." And I'm like, "Damn, you're right. I wasn't." I, you know what I mean? Like that's that's just how utterly like mercenary I am about this shit, right? It's just like everything that comes in comes in through my brain thinking about the world as a writer. You know what I'm saying? And you just got to put yourself there, right? Um, it's no it's no other way that I've ever found, heard of, seen, um, besides just, you know, spending the, spending those hours. So, yeah, over yeah, 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 so Yash asked if I, um, felt pressure to have a fresh take on, um, the Jesse Eisenberg thing, and I was like, um, no, I mean, like, again, like, everyone in this room has, uh, unprecedented consciousness, you know, no one in the history of the planet Earth was ever born in Tehran, Iran. Um, uh, so syntax is identity. 
you know, which means that the way that we talk is formed out of all the conversations that we've had, all of our geographies and genealogies, and you know. Also, and so the, the easy obnoxious answer to your question is no. Um, I just if I if I write an unprecedented experience, then it won't do justice to my lived experience. Um, what I will add to it though is that I hate the hyphen. Um, like just grammatically as as like a sort of like petulant grammarian because it makes like if I call myself Iranian American, it makes Iranian grammatically subordinate to the to Americans, right? It makes Iranian like like a modifier to the word American, like the Iranian is a kind of American that I am. The other way around is that it's equally false if I call myself an American Iranian, right? Like the uh, just, it, just it, it grammatically subordinates what whichever one you put first. So I hate that. I am an Iranian American, you know, like I am both of those things with no, with no hyphen is the way that I will write it if I have to write it. But also like I just, I'm also leery of like for whom that writing is useful, right? Just taxonomically, like who needs, and, but you know, again, this is me being a sort of like petulant grammarian, but just to, to answer your question, no, I didn't feel any responsibility in that way. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. What a generous conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.